Welcome back to the Lance Wall Now Show, the show that promises to always give you something unique for your time. I never want you to say, oh, I wasted my time listening to Lance. So I go out of my way to bring you the most controversial, incisive, incendiary, interesting, or culturally provocative content. And today is not going to be any different because we have a very special guest I've wanted to have for a while, Dr. Eddie Hyatt, uh, Master of Divinity, Doctor of Ministry, Master of Arts. You're quite the academician. And this helps us out a lot today, Eddie. Well, I, I, I trust that works out well today. Yeah, because I just want you to know that we, I'm bringing in the experts. So when we start dropping the truth bombs and they explode out there, remember, this guy's done his homework, all right? Mercedes Sparks. Am I interrupting you, Mercedes? We're doing no, a show. No. No. She's on her phone over there texting. But... No, it's good. All right. So uh, now your husband knows this man. Okay. Because uh, Larry Sparks, who is Mercedes' husband, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who has the privilege of being associated with Mercedes Sparks. I'm like. Yes, and vice versa. And mm -hmm. vice versa. Okay, mm -hmm. so he's a publisher, and he has talked to me about Eddie Hyatt and about his research because mm -hmm. he's a Pentecostal revival historian. Mm -hmm. And so you are. I'm a, the first book I read of yours is really, uh, I was reading about my latter rain roots because okay, yeah. I'm involved with the latter rain movement. That okay. was my, some of my spiritual lineage. And so, but you really, uh, how did you develop this love for Pentecostal history? I, I think it, it started... Um, I grew up in Pentecostalism. I, I grew up around the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of God all of my life. Uh, later in life, uh, I, I felt God led my wife and I into higher education after we'd already been in ministry for some time. And I was studying history in a Pentecostal Assemblies of God Bible College and took a church history course and there was nothing about people like us all through history mm. uh, until you got to the 20th century. And uh, so I, I asked the professor, why are we using a textbook written by a non-Pentecostal evangelical oh. about a course in church mm. history? And he says, nobody has written anything. Wow. <laughs> so that began to stir something inside of me. And eventually, it, it took seven years, but I wrote a book. My very first book published, I think, in 1996 was 2,000 Years of Charismatic Christianity. <laughs> Tracing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from the day of Pentecost down to the present time. And God has really blessed that. It's been translated into all kinds of different languages. Some time ago, I got a, a package with a, a two books, two small books. I couldn't read it, but the person sent it said, these are two Chinese, transla these are Chinese translations of 2,000 years of charismatic Christianity. Hmm. He had taken the English copy to... Uh, to China and the the Chinese, the what they call it, the three self church or something, the official church uh, that is approved by the government of China, they are cessationist. And they tell hmm. all of the people who believe in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit that they're heretics. And so he took it to some underground Christian. They said, we really need this. And so some underground Christians took the book, translated it, got it printed by some kind of, you know, there, there are Christian businesses over there that are fronts for Christian activities. They got it printed. And yes, the, we won't be calling out their names on this show. <laughs> right. <laughs> and anyway, so anyway, that's a little story of the book you're talking about, 2,000 Years of Charismatic I love that. I remember I was with uh, Dutch Sheets. This is just an ADD rabbit trail. I was with Dutch Sheets at Seoul, Korea at a big mega conference, and someone came up to him and said, Dutch, look, your book on intercession is published here in yeah. South Korea. And he picked it up, he was going through it, and he leans over and he says, oh, I don't know how to handle this. This happens to me all the time. They were republishing his books, but he wasn't getting any royalties. <laughs> wow. They were just, I guess, Christian writers, you know, it's right, Christian, yeah, sure. opens, just copy it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so um, your, your experience, though, really inspired me. You were sharing with me earlier about how, all right, we are all worried about America. We're all looking at America. It's in this yeah. downhill toboggan ride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like weirdly labeled as the seven mountain dominionist. What I get more press and recognition, frankly, from the radical left for what I teach than the charismatic sure, community. Yeah. It doesn't know who originated what. You're a Christian so, nationalist. Oh, dear <laughs> Lord, I am. I'm even looking uh, for a jacket. We're going to be doing this thing called the Courage Tour in all the, uh, what are we calling them? What? Key states. Yeah, key states. Key states. Key states. And, and this jacket, I want to get a jacket. I want, I want. I know you might disapprove of it, but it has like a, a flag lining on it. I thought, oh, yeah, I've seen those. How interesting this looks. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're, you're clearly a patriot, Dr. Hyatt. 
And I want you to talk for a moment about the visitation God gave you about hope for America, because my gosh, mm. we're in the struggle mm. of our life here. G yeah, give us true. your experience. Well, 2010, I was, my wife and I, Susan, were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and um, uh, I had given up hope on America. Uh, we had been through the 1990s with the revivals that were, came out of Toronto, Pensacola, which were legitimate moves of the Holy Spirit. God visited, uh, God visited America, Canada. But I, through the, my book, 2,000 Years of Charismatic Christiania, I had studied revivals throughout history in every parts of the world. I'd studied the Great Awakenings in America uh, that had transformed the culture of America at different times. And I came to the place where I realized on up in, this was 2010, those revivals which they had run their course, they never really changed the trajectory of America. They never impacted the culture. The culture had continued to deteriorate. And so I had given up hope that America was like these, those were the best opportunities I'd ever seen. I had given up hope that America would ever see another great national spiritual awakening that would change the trajectory of the nation, save the nation. But one day I was, uh, uh, I was, had been invited to preach at a church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, an old time Pentecostal church, north of, north of Oklahoma City. It was about a two hour drive. And uh, I was going to drive up on Saturday, spend the night in a hotel, and then going up to Kingfisher the next morning. Well, I pulled out on the highway, and as I said earlier, I had not been seeking God in any particular way, hadn't been fasting, seeking God. But you know, God likes to surprise us. And uh, I pulled out on the, the, the highway. I was totally surprised. I, felt, I, I, I never had an experience like this before nor since. But I felt like I was enveloped in the presence of God. And my mind was suddenly flooded with thoughts of hope and faith that America could. And that seemed to be the word that was emphasized, could. Hmm. That America could see another great national spiritual awakening. And this continued for my two-hour drive to my hotel. By the time I got to my hotel, I, was, I could hardly wait to get out of my car and get in my hotel room and start writing down these thoughts of, that are flooding my mind. So I did. I got into my hotel room, and this experience lasted for, I think, another at least five hours. As I sat on my bed, praising God, writing down these thoughts of, of hope and faith that were flooding my mind, and there were two things that stayed with me out of that experience. One was my hope was restored that America can see another great national spiritual awakening. Mm. And my experience that time wasn't would see, but could see. And, and of course, as you know, Lance, Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, if a conditional promise, time for God's people to rise up, and fulfill the conditions. But anyway, mm. uh, well, no, I, I just want to stop right here. You've got yeah. a book called America's Revival Heritage. It came out of that experience. Came out of that experience. All right, America's Revival Heritage, how Christian Reformation and spiritual awakening led to the formation of the United States of America. I see you've got, well, I recognize George Whitfield here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I see some, is this an Af African-American There's an African-American church down there. All right, talk to me about these pictures. What are we, what, what's the deal here? Well, the top left picture you see there, that's George Washington at prayer. All right, we're going to bring this up in post. We'll get this picture there. I wrote an article. It was published in Christmas News because was, was George Washington a Christian nationalist? <laughs> oh, that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, well, what, and because he was, because uh, he was all about America, the, yeah, the being a nation and, 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 and believing God, he was all about prayer. You know, when uh, he be, was appointed commander in chief of the militia, the, these ragtag America militias to fight the British, he realized they had they had no chance if they didn't have help from heaven. So, one of the first things he did was he uh, issued an order that every day was to begin with prayer, led by the commander of each unit. Hmm. He also ordered that there was to be no cursing, no swearing, no drunkenness. Um, this is historically verified. This is historically verified. All right, people, he, he, take note. Hey, take note. Okay, go ahead. Uh, he also uh, ordered that if their duties did not require them to be elsewhere, every soldier was to be in church when there was church, imploring heaven for heaven's assistance in their effort to obtaining liberty. This is flaming mm. Christian nationalism, my friend. Yeah, really. This is embarrassing. But, but you know, here's the thing. He was, it, it wasn't that. His motive was, I want to impose my Christian faith on these soldiers. 
There was desperation. They knew they were going to make it. If they didn't have help from God, they weren't going to mm -hmm. make it. We're, we're going to have to pray. We're going to have to be a praying army if we have any hope of defeating the most powerful army on planet Earth. And so this picture was painted, I forget, I, have, I think I have the painter's name here of him kneeling, actually is a historical experience recorded in history. A Quaker who did not believe in war, who was a pacifist, uh, who lived near Valley Forge, and uh, he was out in the woods one day, and he said he heard the sound of prayer. And he said, I tied my horse to a sapling, and I walked softly through the woods, and he said, I came up on George Washington kneeling by his horse. And he said, I have never heard such a prayer. He was calling upon the God of heaven uh, to assist them in, in their fight for liberty. And uh, he, he said, I went home and told my wife that I saw a sight I never thought I would see. He said, we did not believe a man could be a soldier and a Christian. He said, but if there is one in the world, it's George Washington. <laughs> mm. So George Washington, that's his picture. That's George Whitfield preaching. Uh, George Whitfield was a young man, I think he was 25 years old when he first came to America. And there, there were these regional revivals up and down the eastern seaboard. But George Whitfield, he loved to, he loved to be on the go. He, 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 he wouldn't stay in one place. He traveled up and down the eastern seaboard. And all those regional revivals, they came together in one blazing inferno of spiritual awakening. And I would like to just read one quote from, jo from uh, Benjamin Franklin, how Benjamin Franklin was impacted by this incredible spiritual awakening. Well, it's in there somewhere, but well, anyway. No, no, go, go and look for it for a second because I want to talk to the camera. Okay. So Benjamin Franklin was not a Pentecostal. He was <laughs> not, he was not a Methodist. He was... He, well, he had this Quaker background, but he actually was an intellectual who believed in the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, God in a kind of like, he's there, and he implored the Congress to pray to that friend whose assistance saw us through those days. He saw the power of prayer, but the, the and I don't know the quote you're going to refer to, but I'm from Philadelphia, so I know about Ben Franklin. I grew yes. up with the Franklin Institute, Franklin Museum, he's, he's, that's his city, and uh and Whitfield had so convinced Franklin of the reality of Christianity as a spiritual force that he was trying to get Whitfield to work with him on a project to create a, a city where Dr. Franklin said, you leave the civics to me, you take over the spiritual vitality, we could create a model city, and he wanted to call it Zion in North America, and Whitfield said, I can't do that, Doc, I'm called to preach. So go ahead and uh, share with us what you got. This is from uh, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography that he wrote himself about the, the transformation of Philadelphia when George Whitfield arrived there. He said, in 1739, there arrived among us from Ireland the Reverend Mr. Whitfield, who made himself remarkable there as an itinerant preacher. And you'll find this interesting. Franklin says, he was at first permitted to preach in some of our churches, but the clergy, taking a dislike to him, soon refused him their pulpits. And he was obliged to preach in the fields. So if God closes a door, he may have something better. <laughs> because in the open fields, there was no walls. And the crowds, 10,000, 15,000, were common in Whitfield's meetings. Franklin goes on to say, the multitudes of all sects and denominations that attended his sermons were enormous, and it was a matter of speculation to me, who was one of the numbered, to observe the extraordinary influence of his oratory on his hearers. Now he's going to tell you what happened to Philadelphia. He says, from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Wow. That's real transformation. I love that. You know, <laughs> there's a great story with, we only got 10 minutes, there's so much we could talk about. Great story with Franklin saying that he stopped bringing money to some of Whitfield's sermons <laughs> because uh, he said, you know, he said he was, a piece of, he was a pretty savvy old guy. I mean, he got the French to fund the Revolutionary War. He was a bit of a womanizer. He was street smart. And he said, but I went and I listened to him, and he started talking about the orphans and the orphanage he has in Savannah, Georgia. He said, and um, 
you know, I, I took a copper out of my pocket and threw it in. I thought that would relieve my conviction. And he continued preaching. And as he talks some more, I threw another coin in. So I got this disgust. I threw it all in. And I decided that I wasn't going to bring any money to his meetings anymore. Right, true. But I'll tell you what, that's that's the anointing. Yes. <laughs> the guy was amazing. So and they, they called him Dr. Squintum. And why did it, do you know why they called him Dr. Squintum? He had, he had, a, he had a, a lazy eye. Yeah. So he had a crossed eye. Mm. Imagine the world's most compelling orator actually was like cross-eyed. But you, when you started to hear him, you lost all, all recollection. By the way, there's, I think there's something instructive about this. And Mercedes, I'm going to throw this at you. Mm -hmm. There were, Whitfield was kicked out, basically, of the organized church. Mm. I want you to think about this. We're going to talk about mm. today's awakening. Not just the history. I'm not talking about the history. I'm talking about what's happening today in America that can give us hope for a great revival, a great nation-changing experience. Now watch this. The um, Whitfield had the old lights they were called and the new lights. Right. What was the difference between the old lights and the new lights? I, I explained to our audience what the, what this division was. Well, the 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 old lights, they were the the old timers, the traditionalists. Uh, they didn't want to change. They didn't want anything new. They were against. Uh, the, these emotional revivals, because in Whitfield's revivals, now he's not a Pentecostal, he's not a charismatic, he doesn't even talk about speaking in tongues, but as he preaches, people weep, they fall to the ground, <laughs> they, they cry out to God for mercy. So uh, incredible emotions release through this. And so the old lights were the ones that Franklin mentioned there, the that many of the clergy refused him their pulpits. They wouldn't allow him to preach there. Mm. But uh, he, he didn't get his feelings hurt and say, I'm going back to England. He said, I'll just preach outdoors then. <laughs> now, now, here's the part I want the audience to think about. Because you're, you're stirring up on my memory on something which I believe the Lord showed me for the Great Awakening. That has begun in America. And it's going to continue. That's why you want to go to thecouragetour.com, get involved. Seven key states, 19 key counties. Bam! We're going to Whitfield them. God's collectively bringing teams together to blast these places open. And you need to see it happen and be part of it. But Whitfield was, um, Whitfield had a gift. Remember, he grew up in a tavern. Yeah. So Whitfield's oratorical skills were mastered, shaped, if you will, by God in a bar. Because he could jump up on a table as an 8 to 10 or 12 year old and imitate any of the typical guys at the tavern. So you have this guy over here who talks like this. He, he kind of talked like that and do a joke. Everybody was regaled with laughter because Whitfield could impersonate in the bar anyone. Then, of course, when he goes to Oxford, he gets saved and sanctified. But the talent was there. Mm. So when they rejected him in the pulpits of New England, which I was, I was around, I was up there. I pastored there for a while. I know the territory. He began to characterize and role play the pomposity of the pulpits that weren't responding to him and the highfalutin clergy. And so <laughs> they, the, the Bible talks about the common people heard him gladly, right, referring right, to yeah. Jesus. Yeah. The common people, the workers, the illiterate, he knew how to come, he could jump up on the table in the tavern and make fun of the clergy. Now this was, uh, this was unheard of, the sacred pulpit being mocked. But he wasn't mocking God. He was mocking the out-of-step clergy. So the crowd picked up on two things, a fervor for God, a, a fervor for, for, for salvation, and a rebellious streak against the um, elites and authority. Mm -hmm. True. Now think how that fed the psychology yeah. that fed the, revela the revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The average American who was touched by the awakening had a little bit of a zinger against organized religion that didn't make a place for them. So the hierarchy was destabilized in the DNA of America, and God's great awakening put that contempt for elitism into yep. the American, which is why when we had a praying people and great awakenings happened, and we, it led to revolution. Yep. There, that's, the, that's the track nobody's ever integrated. Whitfield made it fashionable to be rebellious. Yeah, and, uh, and also his... His revivals was the first uh, national event that the 13 divided colonies. Now, you have to realize the, the 13 divided colonies, they weren't all, all that friendly because in the New England, you had the Puritans, uh, 
down in Virginia, you, you had the, um, uh, the, the, the Anglicans, and then you had the Quakers. And in the old world, these people had persecuted each other, imprisoned each other, put people to death. And so, right. so they, they, were not, they were not friendly, the 13 colonies. They were 13 divided colonies. But Whitfield didn't have a denominational bone in his body. And um, he, he did another one of his sermons, uh, illustrated sermons. He was mimicking a, there were thousands of people from all these different sects and denominations. He was mimicking a conversation with Father Abraham, whom he's pictured as leaning over the balcony of heaven. He shouted, Father Abraham, are there any Baptists in heaven? No, there are no Baptists in heaven. Father Abraham, are there any Anglicans in heaven? No, there are no Anglicans in heaven either. Father Abraham, are there any Quakers in heaven? No, there are no Quakers in heaven. Well, what about Methodists? Are there any Methodists in heaven? No, there are no Methodists here in heaven. Well, well, and of course, there's all these people out there. They're, they're all Methodists. He said, well, Father Abraham, what kind of people are in heaven? And Father, and of course, he's mimicking Father Abraham. There are only Christians in heaven, only those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then Whitfield says, oh, is that the case? Then God help me and God help all of us to get rid of labels mm-hmm. and, and, and live as Christians and, and live as real Christians. And so he broke down those religious and cultural barriers. And the Great Awakening was the first national experience event that colonial America ever experienced. It brought them together where they begin to see themselves as one single people oh. under God. Mm-hmm. You could say that Whitfield created the spiritual environment for the United States. He is the spiritual father of America. Mm. My God. Powerful. What do you say, Mercedes? Calvin <laughs> Coolidge student and student of history? Yeah, no, I, uh, I, it's, it's, I have so many thoughts as this conversation train moves down the track. But, I mean, it reminds me of, like, really when Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, right? Mm. So they so, so many different types of people end up getting saved that they have to create a new label mm. to call them, well, these are Christians now because they're all talking about Jesus and there's so many different types. But I also think, too, you know, when we talk about a great awakening, I think the thing that precedes it a lot of times is a great shaking. Like, it's like if you're going to be awakened, so like when my daughter comes in to wake me up at night, it's like, oh, you know, you get a little shaken awaken, you know? And I think as we're going through that as a nation, as a world, when you have people like Joe Rogan that are saying, you know what? We need Jesus Christ. That's who we need. We need Jesus right now. That Mm. there is something that's going on culturally where we've been sold a bill of goods that enlightenment equals um, agnosticism or atheism. That's Mm. true enlightenment. That I think people are really waking up to the fact that, no, actually, I'm created. There is a higher power, and I want to know who that is. And I think we're... we are in, like you just said, the third great awakening, and we stand on a precipice for people who are actual disciples, who are going out and fulfilling the commission that Jesus gave us, which Amen. is go and make disciples. That that is that is where we are as Christians right now. Je- Jesus doesn't want followers. This is something the Lord's been speaking to me about the last couple of weeks. In a millennial way, he doesn't want followers and he doesn't want likes. He doesn't want you consuming his social media feed. He wants you to, to like share and he wants you to be a brand ambassador. And that's, that's the call to Christians. Christians right now, real Christians, yeah. is to go out and share your faith and, and not, disciple not a these consumer, people. but a brand ambassador. Correct. It's interesting yeah. language. By the way, you can get a hold of this book. Let me do some sales work here for you, Doctor. Mm, all Ameri- right. You can go to lancewell.com forward slash Eddie. We could have Dr. Hyatt, but we're calling him Eddie right now, just affectionately. Uh, lancewell.com forward slash E-D-D-I-E. If you're listening to the podcast, get America's Revival Heritage, how Christian Reformation and Spiritual Awakening led to the formation of the United States of America. I have a question for you. Uh, we're gonna to, I, wanna, I wanna put another five minutes on the clock because gonna, we're gonna do another interview. I'm gonna have you back because okay. we got so much more to talk about here. Um, 1726, we're gonna cover this in your next interview, The Year That Defined America. This stellar book is really a, a response to the 16... 1619 Project. The 1619 Project, a horrendous piece of historic fiction on how America was founded. As a, as a slave state and needs to be burnt back to the ground to be built up, which is exactly what um, the devil would like to do to America. Mm-hmm. But you got to know what the logic is and you, know how to, you need to know how to refute it. But I have a question for you because I'm going to go over just two minutes here. 
America's Revival Heritage. So I'm a student of the, of the Great Awakenings, Charles Finney. I been to, used to go to the Spear Library at Princeton mm. University. I think they thought I was a student. Now that I look back on it, I was the age of a student. And I'd go down to the Theological Library, and I had access to all of the old original documents, which mm. meant that I got the books, Finney's original Revival Lectures. Imagine right, this, yeah. 1848, yep. the actual you mm. know, books. Crazy. And Finney said in the abolitionist fervor, Christians were so engaged with abolition, it literally fed yep. the John Brown raid, blah, blah, which led mm -hmm. to the Civil War. Yeah. Now, Finney's argument was that he was concerned that the fervor of political issues, meaning even the abolitionist issue, as worthy as it was, would become such a caustic uh, you know, element to the spirit of prayer and the spirit of revival and evangelism. That he did, that he said it, it would do mischief to the revival. Now we're talking about a period of time where it's like, I guess, in these environments, whether mm. it's a Toronto, now Toronto and Pensacola were more like phenomenologic encounters with the Holy Spirit, but like a Asbury revival, more like evangelical revival, where where you're dealing with issues and conscience. Yeah. But I see it's inevitable that these two streams have got to come together, kind of like mm -hmm. Whitfield leading into the Revolutionary War, or even preachers during that period of time sure because you can't avoid the political battle because that True. cultural warfare has a hundred faces it's trying to bully you into a corner on True. you have to answer with the truth yes. and still do it in the spirit of a revival that's what i think makes it so challenging we can't do either or we have to do both and am i am i missing something no here? no i i totally agree and i i think i think the the thing is that keeps us Focus is that we must never lose the centrality and focus on Jesus. We're calling people to Him, uh, whether we're dealing with, um, you know, in the political arena or revival or whatever. Ultimately, we're calling people to Jesus. I'm not asking people, you know, people accuse me of being a Christian nationalist. I'm not asking people to submit to me. I'm calling on people to submit submit to Jesus, whether it's Joe Biden <laughs> right. or right. whoever it right. is. And this is this is where the founders were. They were all in agreement. I don't care if it was Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson who had some leanings, you know, uh, questions about uh, historic Orthodox doctrine. All of them believed that only America could only prosper and be a happy nation if they accepted the morals of Jesus, that, uh, that there, there needed to be a national morality. Well, John Adams said this, our constitution was made only for a moral and Christian people. Mm. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. So really, it I agree with you, you, you can't avoid it. Wholly inadequate, he said. Wholly inadequate. For any other type For the of governance people. of any other kind of people except a... Uh, a moral and religious, and when they use religious, they're talking about Christianity, a moral and Christian people. Our constitution will not work for any other kind of people, he said. Mm -hmm. So, no, we, can, we, we can't avoid the two streams coming together if we're going to save America. Mm -hmm. Because America, uh, the Second Amendment did, uh, w was stopping Congress from establishing a Constantinian type of Christianity where you have an official church that has the power of the state behind it. Mm. That's what the Second Men was about. It had nothing to do with keeping Christians out of, out, out of the government, out of the state. It was stopping the government from ever establishing a, a state church that began with Constantine that would have the power to impose its will mm -hmm. and its doctrines on the populace. Because we must not forget the second part. Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion, nor hindering the free exercise thereof. And here's something interesting. The day after, in 1787, the day after they ratified uh, that First Amendment, those same people issued, proclaimed a national day of prayer and thanksgiving. <laughs> mm -hmm. A national day of prayer and thanksgiving. A after... They ratified the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law, which mm -hmm. just it's confirmed so their hearts. They had that had nothing to do with them wanting to stop the influence of Christianity. They wanted the influence of Christianity everywhere. Mm -hmm. Talk about Christian nationalism sneaking in on day one. The virus was getting into the government people <laughs> because it was uh, founded with those influences. Well, Dr. Hyatt, 
We have, uh, we've got to go, give me, put up the uh, link again. It's going to be lancewellnut.com forward slash Eddie, E-D-D-I-E. You can get a hold. Oh, this is lancewellnut.com. Go ahead. You put it up there. We have either or, Mr. but the Producer. podcast doesn't know. Uh, lancewellnut.com forward slash 1726. Did I see that? Thank you. <laughs> you can get the book there too. I'm glad. I'm glad we're going to go, we're going to go for a twofer here. These are both great. Both. And uh, we're going to have you back on the show again, well, Dr. Hyatt. But let's be really clear. It's not buy one, get one. You said two for women will think. <laughs> oh. Women like me, like, it's buy one, get one? No, 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 no. Oh my you got to get both. <laughs> yeah, get both and help the man. The yeah. man's out there preaching. He's living by faith. We need to support people like this. All right. So we're going to come back, have you back and talk about the lie about the racist America. Yeah, we're going to really. blow it up. We're going yeah. to take this. See this? Take this, this is like this shark right here. I'm going to beat that thing. We're going to smash that shark. All right. Well, God bless you, Doctor. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me on today. Mercedes, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for being. Looking forward to seeing you back again here tomorrow. You don't want to miss it. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends. Because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.